Welcome to our go-to-market session today. Hosted or uh, the speaker today is Jeffrey Na. This Emerge program is under the whole program, a seven-month series where we are helping small business who are struggling due to COVID-19. This whole program of seven months is supported by Google.org. Speaking about our speaker for today, Jeffrey is the former banker turned entrepreneur and investor with 40 years of business experience across Asia Pacific. He has lived in seven countries and built businesses across Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Thailand. He's a venture builder and invested in technology, education, healthcare, security, and media startups and venture capital funds, including 500 startups, Wavemaker Partners, and Blue Cloud Ventures. He mentors at ACE, NTU, and US Enterprise. He lectures part-time on entrepreneurship and innovation at NTU, SMU, and NUS. He's a judge at the following competitions, SMU, Lee Kuan Yew, Global Business Plan, Tech Fest, Vietnam 2018 and 19. Oh, the list goes on. He's also a charter member with Thai Singapore. Jeff is passionate about helping Singapore and the next generation transform and grow through technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Today, Jeffrey is going to talk about go-to-market strategies for early scale small businesses who are struggling and you know, working their way out in the new novel. Jeffrey, over to you. Thank you very much, Sidi uh, and, and Thai Singapore for having me here today. It is indeed my pleasure and to be able to share uh, what I picked up in marketing over the years, especially in mentoring the startups and go-to-market strategies. So let me share my screen now. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So, uh, okay. So go to market strategy um, as part of the Thai Singapore Emerge program that seeks to educate and help our startups to grow and scale across. And I think if I heard CD correctly, you meant uh, not only startups, but also SMEs as well. Um, so today I'm gonna to be covering with you in about 45 minutes, uh, leaving uh, five or uh, 15 or 10 or 15 minutes for Q and A. So we'll probably try to stop by uh, uh, 545, 550. Um, so that, contents today I'll be covering is, first of all, why is selling important for a business? And then I'll help you understand how to size your market and how to do your competitive analysis. Because no market and no startup is alone unto itself. Um, the company that thinks that you don't have a competition has got a problem uh, because competition is all, all over you and it's always direct and sometimes not so direct, I mean indirect or substitutes. So you must consider not only direct and indirect competition in your competitive analysis, but also alternative products which may not be in direct competition with you, but are good substitutes at a lower value price that you can deliver, which in part satisfies um, the market's demand. Then we'll take a look at the go-to-market strategy in pro uh, proper. I'll share with you some principles as well as uh, some case studies uh, specifically on Gojek. I trust that everybody knows what Gojek is and uh, all about. And also another familiar case study, Fitbit. Uh, for those of you who exercise or, or uh, do um, fitness, you will probably be familiar with Fitbit. Then thereafter, I'll talk a little bit about brand building and why brand building is increasingly important and also equally important is performance marketing and how to balance between brand building and performance marketing. And last but not least, um, we all know that our daily lives are now invaded with social media. And how to use social media as a marketing tool? When to use it? Is it for a B2B, B2C? And especially in an age where marketing, the key word of marketing is relevance. It has always been, but it's increasingly in, uh, important in the digital world. So let's get started. So why is selling important for a business? Um, there are three C's, there are three words here, they represent three C's. Selling is important for a business because you need 
customers. And if you have customers, you will have cash. And as they say, cash is the lifeblood of a company and all entrepreneurs must pay heed to the phrase cash is king because the best products you have, the best everything, if your cash flow doesn't flow, cash flow is like the, the, the blood in your, in your stream. So if you don't have enough of the right kind of blood, you're in, in trouble. So you need to get cash infusion. So many startups have asked me, how much cash do I need? Uh, how much cash do I burn? Um, can I just uh, go on user acquisition? Now that's a question that we're gonna talk a little bit about later. And it's very important because to manage your blood flow. As you know, in our human anatomy, if our blood flow is too much or too little or too fast or too slow, you either have high blood pressure or low blood pressure and neither is good for your health. And so it is for cash for the company. And of course, if you have no customers, no cash, you have absolutely no credibility. And then the whole cycle become a vicious cycle and that's when startups fail. This is an uh, extract uh, from seven top lessons from the 100 failed startups of all time. Most startups, uh, unfortunately, overestimate the market need, or they have a wrong idea of exact, what exactly the market need, or they don't have a precise enough idea of exactly the kind of market segment they're choosing to serve, or exactly what the market needs in that specific segment they choose to serve. And if they do understand the market, then the marketing is not appropriate or poor. As you can see, the third uh, worst reason why startups fail is run out of cash. So if you don't understand the market, and if you have poor marketing, you will run out of cash inevitably. And obviously the rest of it will follow. You don't scale, you don't have the right business model. You're difficult to realize your true product uh, potential and you will have problems attracting the best team or investors, and you will have eventually a poor product and lack of focus, and then you will uh, detract from your main mission. And then you will be dependent on other parties, and then you are out of control. You're like an automobile that is out of control. So now that we establish that selling is very important for a business and the lifeblood of a business is cash, now we talk about how do you decide what is the market to serve and how you analyze your competition. You first have to understand what is the size, the potential market size, and what does kind of target user you are targeting and what is the trend in terms of that's evolving with regard to the size of the market and the target users. Because we want to target a growing market, not a static market, even if it's big. And markets evolve, so you need to follow the trend. Then you need to talk about what funds you have available to be able to execute and what product or service you want to have key differentiation relative to your major competitors. So this is a market sizing that you need to do deep dive analysis on early on in your product development. And your market analysis and segmentation should take into mind whether you're B2C or B2B or B2B2C or B2G, meaning B business to government, you need to take note of the geographic segment you choose to serve, whether it's a country, a population size or a region or the demographic profile of the market segment. But not only that, also the psychographic and the behavioral traits of the markets that you choose to serve. Then and only then are you able to segment your markets well and then clearly define your target market segments. And with that, your ability to position your product, your brand, and how your product or your service solves a problem for the segment you choose to serve well. Then obviously um, you will then be able to see that your market planning, the market mix for each segment might be the same, might be different. That is why some companies like Unilever or Procter & Gamble has different brands because they're choosing to serve different segments and the different segments require different mix. So as to your product market fit, 
is all about targeting the target customer. Then about either it's unserved segment or an underserved segment that you choose to serve. Then on the other side of the coin is your product. So first is what is your key value proposition? And your key value proposition cannot be in isolation. Your key value proposition can, has to be, how do you stand out relative to your competition, known or unknown, <coughs> sorry, in the segment you choose to serve? And then and only then will you figure out your product features that you need to evolve and adapt. And with that, a UI UX, a user experience that you will need to evolve according to tailor to the market needs. Sounds like a very tall order. Maybe it is, but if you do your due diligence and you get out of the building, as they say in startup language, and get demand validation from the exact markets that you choose to serve, then you will have a clear understanding of how to slice and dice in the market you choose to serve. So uh, let me give you an example uh, from the theory. So Grab, what does Grab, uh, what does Grab do? What is Grab's value proposition? Then we look at the pain point or the problem. Now, passengers are always waiting for cabs for a known amount of time and they can't control the cost of the ride. And also payment is not so difficult. And sometimes you don't have the right change or uh, sometimes you have bad service and you have bad drivers. Uh, so this is the problem that Grab seeks to serve as it does a ride hailing app. How does it improve? How does it solve the problem? It gives the customer, puts the, the control in the hand of the customer to track the cap with a one click, easy and ability to cancel. And they have a trusted drive because Grab would have screened their drivers. I know it's not always possible to have a 100% best quality driver and friendly, polite, uh, trusted drive. But at least with the screening, I think 90% of it will be good. And the Grab drivers are being tracked on how they are taking you from one point to another and you get to pay for your ride once you're done very easily. What are the pain points they reduce? They, you can get cab within five minutes, not, not 30 minutes or 45 minutes, especially on a rainy day. But even then in a rainy day, it's gonna be more than five minutes, right? And so the, it's a demand and supply situation. But with the Grab's app optimization, you are able to reduce um, the amount of wait time five times. So you only need to wait like 10, 20% of the time that you'd normally wait. And you can book a cab in advance. So then it reduces the pain point and the reduction of the number of bad drivers. So as you can see, Grab has a clear value proposition as a ride app, as a ride hailing app. So it's a passenger mobile and you can choose the kind of cars you want, whether you want a standard taxi or you want a grab car, which is a, or, or either or grab car, or if you want a premium. But for large families, you can choose the seven seater uh, MPV, multi-purpose vehicles, or you want a super app, or if you want to drive your pet to see your vet, then you can have a different station. So again, this is all the diff key differentiation points in what Grab's value proposition is to create the gains and relieve the pains of the problem of passengers. Now let's take a look to our attention to another example. This is Airbnb. Everybody knows Airbnb. So I pick examples that are very clear. So Airbnb is a marketplace. So it's a marketplace for short-term cheap accommodation that can be booked hassle-free with safe booking. It's also a marketplace for people with properties they want to rent out on short term to make additional money. So that's the problem. So the problems are on the one side, people with uh, rooms or apartments or houses that want to rent on short term to make additional spare money. And on the other side, um, people who want to travel on the cheap and want cheap accommodation or wants a home field environment, 
uh, that is hassle-free, that's easy and safe to book. And that they are able to see what it looks like and it's validated and they can unlock the booking very easily. So what is the gains for, for the customer to use Airbnb? Save money because, and they get local experiences because your host um, can be your, your concierge, so to speak, uh, to tell you what sites to see, where to eat, where to go, what to see. And you are able to sometimes uh, share the warmth of your host. Um, sometimes they bake you breakfast. Uh, sometimes they, they even be your tour guide. Uh, so it gives you lots of options, flexible booking and easy cancellation. What are the pain points it reduces? It allows you to make friends with others who are sharing the apartment or booking the room. And it reduces safety concerns because Airbnb would have validated your host. It's not 100%, but it's better than no validation. And again, on the quality and the cleanliness and the hygiene and the accessibility of the accommodation, this would have been validated by Airbnb. So a lot of the problems are resolved with one simple click. So they have the value proposition is a marketplace for renting out short-term living space and an aggregation platform for activities for tourists to do on the cheap in a new city with a host. So in terms of brand, you can see these are, I, I put very well-known brands. So these are branded goods, everybody knows this. So it's easier for me to explain how to do a brand competitive analysis. So if you compare Prada versus Louis Vuitton versus Gucci and versus Burberry. So they all have very different emphasis on their value proposition, on their target audience, and the range of their authority. What do you mean by the range of their authority? Their specialty. So you can see Prada specializes in leather goods, clothing, eyewear, fragrances, and jewelry. And that's pretty much similar to Louis Vuitton and also similar to Gucci. Also, but slightly different on um, Burberry because Burberry as you can see, they have beauty and they have home. So there's a subtle difference there in terms of how they are being perceived as an authoritative brand. But look at their value proposition. Prada focuses on the image of innovation, elegance, and style. Whereas Louis Vuitton positions themselves as classical, superior quality. Gucci is hip, sexy, cutting edge, and contemporary. Whereas Burberry is very English. They position themselves as the epitome of the English culture and the democratic luxury. So the positioning is different. If you look at the relationships of the positioning and the target audiences, they're also very different. So I won't belabor you on all of that, but you can see that the positioning of these guys who sell similar products are positioning for a different audience and they use different value proposition and build different kinds of relationships with their target audience. Now let's talk a little bit about go-to-market strategy. What are the principles of go-to-market strategy? So I see the triangle, I like triangles. Um, so a go-to-market strategy, what is a go-to-market strategy? It's about how do you take your product to the markets, to your customers in the market you choose to sell. So which means what to sell, where to sell, how to sell. So really go-to-market strategy is your marketing strategy. So it involves who you will go after, what will you offer them, and how will you get to them? And how will you make it happen? So if you look at it, you could start with like this wheel. These are seven easy steps in terms of formulating your effective go-to-market strategy. So marketing strategy involves who the firm will go after, what it will offer them, and it's a component of your overall marketing strategy on how your company is gonna make it happen. Starting with, what are your target markets? 
Who are your target markets? What about your brand positioning that we spoke about earlier on? What are you offering? Not only what are you offering, but what are you offering that's different than the competitor brands that are serving in the segment you choose to serve? And then what are your channels? What are your go-to markets? Are you going to do distribution channel? Are you going to do direct? Are you going to do B to B to C or B to G or or B to C direct? And how will you build your but your your budget model, your revenue model, your cost model? How, and what is your marketing strategy ultimately? As we talked about earlier on, first the segmentation, and then positioning, and then eventually your planning and your marketing mix. So first we can say, start with defining your target markets, which is what we said earlier. Define your target market size, your demographic, psychographics, um, geographic, um, be very precise, as precise as possible. And then profile your customer as profile as possible. Here, your buyer persona. Don't just say they are male or female or they're 18 to 25 or 25 to 45. It's too broad. Try to narrow it very precisely, okay? Um, and then your brand positioning. What is your brand positioning? You need to think about what's unique about your product. What's unique about how you deliver? How does one differentiate from the other? For example, if you talk about a petrol station or gas station as the Americans call it, if you choose ExxonMobil or you choose Shell or you choose Caltex, what's the difference? They're basically selling the same petrol, but different people will stick to different brands. And they will swear that the different brands and within the different brands, they'll sell you different octane levels. Do you want the standard brand or do you want 95 or do you want 98 or, or, or better uh, quality? Does that have any a lot of impact on the quality of your drive or your car? Marginally perhaps, but there's a lot of brand positioning. What about the, your cell phone? Whether you use M1, Starhub or Singtel, is there a difference? Yes, subtle difference in terms of the bundling and packaging and in terms of how the position and price, but generally, if you can speak and the quality of the voice is clear and you can go anywhere and the signal is good and you can do data as well as you can do voice and you can have a lot of apps download. So it seeks to differentiate it. In this case, for example, in terms of Apple, why is Apple so successful? Apple um, actually makes 70% of the global profits of all mobile phone companies. Why? Because it has a specific Apple App Store. So the Apple App Store actually gives people a lot of apps that are unique to Apple and they take a cut of it. But then once people got used to getting the App Store, it's not so easy. Of course, Google is challenging with the Google Play Store, but again, it's different. The app may, some may be the same, some may not be the same. So people get used to different user interfaces as well. I've got client uh, customers who, who use uh, Apple and would swear by Apple, it would never change to another brand because they say the interface, they got used to it. So you're hooked. So that's a way to do your brand positioning as well. And then you need to de 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 define your very service offerings very clearly for the specific segment. Why are you different? What is it that serves your customer better than any of your competition? You need to not only deliver that, you need to be able to communicate that well, because even if you have these extra unique value propositions, but you're not able to communicate it well, then that doesn't go. Then considering all of the above, number five is to complete your marketing strategy, complete your marketing mix, including your go-to-market channel on who, what, and how you will make it happen. And again, this is again, in another example, uh, everybody knows Hai Di Lao in Singapore. It is the Chinese hot pot. Why is the Chinese hot pot so popular? There are so many hot pots. Why everybody wants to go to Hai Di Lao? So what makes you different from the competition? Why would somebody choose your hot pot versus other hot pots? Why would people view you? The, how would they view you differently relative to other hot pots? What do you can you say about uh, the top three values about eating 
a hot pot at Haiti Lao versus other hot pot joints? What kind of resources, what kind of materials do you need to sell your value proposition? How will your target audience use the product? When will they use it? How will they use it? Who will they eat with? Do they normally eat uh, in a couple or is it in a family group or in a large friends group? So who are your product customers? What are their specific characters? And how do they behave? And in what stages are they in your customer's buying journey and the behaviors they take before the purchasing? Now, the behaviors your customer take before the purchasing refers to your customer journey, customer buying journey specifically. The better you understand that, the better you are able to serve your customer. Now we talk about a case study of Gojek. Gojek, as you know, is very much like uh, Grab, but it's different than Grab because uh, it's predominantly in Indonesia. It's already in Singapore and I believe in the Philippines and, and also Vietnam. It's in less markets than Grab, but it has more services than Grab. So let's see how Gojek's market strategy is a bit different. So first, let's look at the business line kit, and then we look at the SWOT analysis, and what is the Gojek's go-to-market strategy of in terms of what, which is the product and the value proposition, and who, uh, in terms of the market segment and the beachhead they chose to serve, how will they go to the market in terms of channel strategy, and where, that means how will they promote their value. So their coverage area is basically all across Indonesia, okay? And interestingly enough, they target the drivers. So as you can see, more specifically, this is called the uh, Bogo Depok Tangaram Bekasi. This is the greater Jakarta area. And they know that they are going to already well-established in Jakarta. Now they want to go outside the Jakarta area. This takes you a few years back. So as you can see, they know very precisely what is the population? How many motorcycles are there? How many cars, how many buses and trucks? So in each different city, so very precise. So you need to know very precise. And then you need to track with the app how your driver growth and how many customers grow with you. And what is the size of your order, the customer, the payment? And it's hyper competition. So hyper competition, why? Because Gojek now offers a plethora of services, just like WeChat. So it delivers um, all of these things. You can, you can book a massage. You can get a cleaner for your house. You can get somebody to wash your car. Um, you can book a taxi. You can get somebody to go to the minimart to buy you something you forgot. Um, you can basically get any services you want, including buying your groceries for you. So it did it. SWOT analysis, so how does it compete? The SWOT analysis is very critical because it has understand, it helps you to understand what are your strengths or weaknesses, what are the opportunities and the threats, and how do you then devise a competitive strategy, go to market strategy that will address specifically your SWOT positioning. So again, go to market strategy is about who, what, how, and where. So Gojek's value proposition is they remember very clearly, no drivers, no customers. So the, they have to make sure they have the largest selection of the best drivers, right? So that's number one, no driver, no customers, no passengers. But secondly, they also don't want to restrict to ride hailing and, 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 and ride rides, they want to be a multi-service uh, super app. But they also know that they have to be easy to use or nobody's gonna use it. And people who are not so digital savvy and so that is very easy for virtually everyone. And then they need to ensure they have a cashless, seamless cashless payment system that integrates well with the platform. And you have to ensure that the consumer is assured that what they get and buy from Gojek will be competitive, fair price. So they chose to do study their segmentation. So are they, are they segmenting, uh, are they serving employees or are they serving businessmen 
Are they serving the housewife or the students? Now, this is very important. By region, it might be different. So as you can see, they were already attempt now to look at who are their customers for which services in which region. And a beachhead, what is a beachhead? A beachhead is your launch pad, is your point of attack, is your initial point of attack in a new market segment you choose to serve. So you need to have a new beachhead which will get you early and easy adoption fast. That's very critical because once you are able to launch well and sink yourself into the segment you chose to serve, then your scaling and market expansion and product innovation and new product mix added becomes much easier. Then you talk about how, how do you go to market? Okay. What's your channel framework? Do you do a direct channel direct to the, the, the market? Or do you do indirect channel with representatives or regional operations or partnerships or different channels? Now, what is go to market for, for uh, um, Gojet? Is that both the drivers, how do they find the drivers? Do they recruit them directly or they get recruitment company to do? Or do they get all the channel partners to supply them? Or do they go, they look for corporates to do that? Or Mitra. Mitra means partners. Okay. Uh, Mitra is uh, like the uh, partners. So go jet, go pay, go live. They look for partners to promote the different product lines. Either the same distributor or different distributors. Okay. And then eventually they get to the customer. So this is a B to B to C. The, the left side direct channel is B to C direct. And of course, uh, in between, you have government, local governments, police, military, academics, community organizations, social organizations. So then we talk about where, where and how do they promote it, right? Are they going to promote it on digital format? Are they going to promote it through uh, over-the-top television, pay TV? Or are they going to promote it through normal TV channels? Or are they going to do press conferences? or road shows? The answer lies to probably a combination of those, but for different segments or regions that they choose to serve, depending on the product mix, the combination of this promotion plan might be different. So for example, they can do a placement on the billboard. So if uh, uh, there's a big traffic and there's a lot of traffic jam, and in a traffic jam, uh, people are sitting in a car. If you have a big billboard, you become very visible especially if they're riding motorbikes. Then um, if they want to target students, then they should go to the university or college campuses. And they know college and university campuses have large concentration of people. So there is not enough to have a billboard. There they need to have a recruitment of driver or students who can do part-time, become part-time uh, drivers, but they also can conduct seminars and share knowledge about how they can become drivers or even build uh, brand awareness and acquire passengers. Let's turn to our uh, next example of a go-to-market strategy of Fitbit. So Fitbit, let's take a look at how they do the market launch. Um, this is not uh, of the original, I'll explain. And who the target audience, what is their direct marketing campaign? What is the business case and the summary of this campaign? So Fitbit is already launched in this situation. Now it wants to introduce an app called a Fitbit Smart Coach. What does this app do? This app tracks your activity, your diet, your weight, and your sleep. And for $49 annually, you can have the Fitbit Smart Coach on your phone, on your tablet, and it's synchronized with your Fitbit wrist watch. What does this do? It drives increased revenue subscription. And it means new source of revenue for Fitbit other than just selling the watch. Um, it drives the product differentiation. So other watches do not have this, right? But now everybody does this already. But at that time, nobody has this. 
So what this does for Fitbit is that it increases the revenue description. So they can increase the premium by increasing the coverage or the data storage of the thing. At the same time, it drives brand awareness of Fitbit. Because if somebody, the friend saw somebody's handphone they are using and tracking that and own a Fitbit, they might ask them about it or they might blog about it or they might share in social media about it, about their fitness level, about how they look better, trimmer, fitter, you know, people like and then they share in the social media. And then there, the free Fitbit will get free advertising. And if they target a persona that has a, normally a desk job, earns $100,000 per year, willing to pay $49 a year for good reviews on good healthy habits. So they give blogs about how to eat healthy, how to exercise healthy, how much is good for you, how are you tracking. And they even know what is the profile of the age and where they live and who wants to have to try to get fit more regularly. So they can have both paid and own channel. What do you mean by own channels? Own channels can be done marketing with little or no additional uh, costs. When you do newsletters and announcements through email or through push notifications, then and through social channels and device box insert. That means device box means when you sell the, the, the Fitbit, you put inserts on um, promoting, cross promoting your app then it, it costs little or no money, okay? And on the product itself, you can have a display on the product itself that says, hey, subscribe for the, you, congratulations, you bought a wonderful thing that's gonna help you be more beautiful, more fit and more trim uh, by controlling your diet, your exercise and your sleep. But on top of that, if you have this app along with your Fitbit, you can do that a lot better. So they give free 30 day trial, so that, avoids them having to spend a lot of display ads in social media, which have cost them a bump. So that's what I call uh, very intelligent marketing. But they also do some of the paid ads. Of course, there's a combination of the two, but then it reduces the cost per acquisition. So what do they end up with the model? They optimize the spending of their own channels together with some paid channels. They are retargeting the techniques to focus on those device owners who already have their device, but don't have the app. So they are cross-selling the app into the existing device customers. And then at the same time, they're increasing the awareness with the retail feature and the box inserts that the Bob leaflets that they put in the box that comes with the purchases of your new Fitbit. And then they can adjust seasonally what the your, your um, offer is. So Christmas time, they might make a different bundle. So see what they've done. So over time, as you can see in uh, Q4, 2014, they achieved subscription revenue of $6 million and their marketing cost is 5 million. So you say not bad, but not good. But look at 2016, they generate revenue that's more than 10 times what it cost them to do the marketing. Amazing, right? So Fitbit Small Smart Coach will increase the revenue, but not only that, but it also increases the brand awareness of Fitbit. And now the target market is not only current Fitbit customers, but overall with the use of the smart app, the Fitbit customers will help them to sell to their friends. So the overall marketing ads is 25 million. First quarter marketing ads, 5 million. Eventually, they estimated that they got 192 million revenue. So we talked a little bit about the examples of go-to-market strategy. Let's talk a little, turn our attention to a little bit about what do you mean by brands? So brands, they are essentially, if you want to classify, there are nine kinds of brands, disruptive, conscious, service, innovative value. As you can see, disruptive is like Airbnb is an example of disruptive. Service is like a Ritz-Carlton hotel. Innovative is like an Apple, Nike, or Amazon. Value, the ones who go to Walmart or Ikea 
are looking for value. That means um, a five-star quality at a four-star price. Performance, BMW, American Express is all about performance. Tiffany, Mercedes-Benz, Hermes is about luxury and so on and so forth. So are you a performance brand? Are you a luxury brand, style brand, experience brand? Disney is the perfect epitome of an experience brand. So in the 1990s, 80 billion are spent in mass awareness advertising. So it creates only awareness, but it doesn't drive interest, desire, and action. So that's for the salespeople to do. But in the 2020s, you'll find that the growth from 1990 in the to, to 2020 has grown into digital channels where 60% of the digital spend is allocated to below the funnel level. That means to increase interest, to increase desire and call to action. So brand building versus performance marketing. Performance marketing is more short-term data-driven. So you can, like Amazon knows exactly what kind, based on what kind of book you read, what kind of exercise you might be doing and how many hours you might be working and whether you need supplements or not. And brand building is longer term creative focus, but longer term, it's more effective. So how do a company blend balance between performance marketing and brand building? You need to have clear KPIs and budgets and always test, test, test. Test small ones and whatever works is the optimal combination is when you should scale. Last but not least, everything is social now. Everything is social. From your digital marketing strategy planning to the content marketing, to a digital experience and user interface, email marketing, email is not irrelevant. Email is still very relevant in social media marketing. So planning your web analytics to driving your marketing strategy and printing and to your search engine of optimization on Google and paid media. Everything is important. Everything has to come together. And most important, it has to be a multi-channel digital experience. And more often than not, your likelihood of people to see your brand will be on mobile. On desktop, less likely. On in-store, even less likely as we move into the future. So branding, customer onboarding experience, incremental approach to paid marketing, and organic to paid marketing ratio. These are important key success factors for your social media strategy in terms of your go-to-market. Now, lastly, in an era of relevance, what do I mean? Uh, it's moving, the world is moving from mass marketing, which is over television, radio, newspaper ads, mass advertising to more digital because technology has enabled it to do what they call traditionally one-to-one -one marketing. So now with technology and data, everything can be almost one-to-one -one anything. So in the 2020s versus the mass production marketing is now digitization of everything. And with COVID-19 happening this year, you can see even more things are digitized, even hawker centers right? And even your web markets. So customer attraction, personalization, and the experience mm -hmm. and the person now touch that you can deliver with the digital experience is much different than it was before. So you need new tools to drive in this era of relevance. So how do you be relevant in a new era of relevance or what we call marketing in the era of relevance? First, you need to use data to personalize the experience. So the customers feel that your product or your service is tailored to their needs and priorities, not a mass product, one size fit all. Then customers need to feel secure when dealing with your customer, dealing with your company digitally, of course. Otherwise they will not transact. Then the customer wants to have, feel a sense of belonging that they can relate to your brand. And now with the green movement, increasingly people are, uh, companies are finding that uh, Gen Z and the millennials 
prefer to deal with companies, even if it's slightly more expensive, if they are green. So going green uh, works well because the buyer now can feel more uh, related to your brand. And of course, people want to feel proud. Why do people want to drive a BMW or Mercedes Benz? Or why do people want to wear an Omega watch or a Rolex watch? Because it, it's a self-esteem. The brand represents the persona. So they want the brand to carry what they want the, the, a bit of the brand value of the brand to rub up on them. So if I'm wearing an Omega watch, I want to be like the Omega man. And traditionally, James Bond uses Omega, right? So that's the thing. And Rolex, they say, is the choice of champions, right? And Tech Heuer, for example, says unbreakable. So depending on how the customer want to position or see themselves, this is how the brand should position for the customer they chose to serve. And ultimately, customers feel that the company shares and advances their values, whether it be the green movement or the company does a lot of corporate social responsibility work for a better world. And that the, if they have a lot of pets, they want the company to be pet friendly, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my presentation for today's workshop on go-to-market strategy. Now, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, folks, if you have any questions, please, either you could raise your hands and we could, uh, you know, switch on your video and take it from there, or you could put in the Q&A box. Uh, we have one question, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, this is specific to India. Uh, would, would you feel comfortable taking an India question? Sure. How I'm, does Grab and Airbnb model differ from Ola, Uber, and Oyo? Can you share India or city-specific GDM strategy nuances? Yeah, I think it's not so different. As they say, devil lies in the details. If you follow the generic concepts that I shared that Grab or Airbnb use, is equally appropriate. For Ola or for Flipkart, it's equally appropriate. Now, the devil lies in the details. Now, the customer segmentation, the demographic segmentation, the income segmentation is different for different parts of India. And in fact, I tell a lot of my friends that uh, India as a country is more diverse than the entire European continent. Uh, but my fellow Singaporean friends don't believe me, but uh, if they still don't believe me, I'll let them talk to CD. <laughs> okay. So the devil lies in the details. So all those principles can still be adopted and applied. But the question is, how do you apply it? How do you vary it to be relevant for the Indian market? Then you should not be talking about Indian market. You should be talking about by state, by region, by county. Because the demographic psychographics and the personas of the individual segment you choose to serve is very different. But if you are serving nationwide, then your profile targets is different. But even if like Gojek, if you are serving nationwide, you can see in terms of Gojek, they even go to defining by region. By region, how much male, how much female, uh, how much drivers, how many university campuses, uh, where, where and how. So because every region is gonna be different. And because India is so vast and so diverse, there is no one strategy fit all. So if anyone is looking for uh, one formula that cuts through everything, it doesn't exist. As they always say, the devil lies in the details. The principles remain the same though. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we've got Denise who's raised her hand. Uh, Denise, uh, if you could ask your question here. Yes, please go ahead. Denise, if you don't mind, can you turn on your... Sorry, if you ask I, question? I clicked it. I clicked it by accident. I'm not raising my hand. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry about that. All right. Anybody else who would like to ask a question? Jeff, I have one. Please. As an early stage startup or a business, 
um, I, I understand like, and not only India, I mean, if you're moving, it's an expansion question. Yeah. So if I'm mm. moving away from my local market, which is Singapore, uh, when I see Philippine, Vietnam, I can decide on, uh, am I right in understanding that for Philippines, Vietnam, small countries, comparatively small, I can decide on one strategy. But like you mentioned, say for Indonesia or for India, the devil lies in the details and you have to have multiple strategies. What would be your approach when somebody is targeting a bigger market like a US or China or India or Indonesia, for example? Again, um, the size of the market is, uh, I mean, size of population of the market is only one consideration of the market segment that you choose to serve. The income demographic is very important also. How much are they able to earn? So if you go to a poorer country or you go to a richer country like the United States, so assuming if you are from a major metro, uh, uh, you serve the four metros in India. Now you go to the Philippines and um, you find that you cannot target the metros. Now you want to target the villages. It's very different. It's very, very different. Now, can you generalize all the villages as the same? Depending. Depending on your product, and depending on the market segment you choose to serve, by their affordability, how much can they afford? And what is their behavioral pattern? Now, even the big companies like Procter & Gamble and Unilever have discovered that what works in India doesn't work in Vietnam. And what works in Vietnam 10 years ago don't work in Vietnam today. So markets are constantly evolving so devil lies in the details. You really need to get to the ground and you need to understand the ground in deep detail because otherwise you will be shooting off tangent. Thanks, Jeff. A follow on question onto that is then that means that should we or entrepreneurs decide to go and stay in that particular country where they want to expand for some time to understand the field law, the law of the land before they plan their strategy or Second option is mm. that they should ha identify a strong partner, either a VC or uh, you know a channel partner or a customer who's a customer here and then his head, you know his subsidiaries perhaps there. What is the right way, or is it there is no easy uh, or free lunches? You have to go set yourself there for three months and then think. What, what is the right way? What what would be the right approach? There is no one right approach, and I. I think if, if you are ready to go and sit there for six months and feel the land, in six months, you can gain certain amount of experience that you couldn't in six weeks. And definitely in six days, you can't. Um, so there are different levels of experience. If you can spare the time, it's always good to have it firsthand. But if you can't spare the time, it's always good to have a partner. So my recommendation is always a hybrid. That means go spend a week there, feel there, but use that week to identify different channel partners, local guys, but pick local guys that you can trust, pick local guys that come recommended, pick local guys that have a track record, pick local guys that have the chemistry with you and is trustworthy. And then you would have had a feel of the land, but not enough to know it all, but enough to manage your channel partner. Got it. Super clear. Uh, any other question, guys? Also, while you're thinking of the question or typing it, there is a short poll uh, we have to launch, uh, you know, to uh, for everyone. And we'll really appreciate that before you log off, if you could take part in that poll. Uh, Sudha, is it possible for you to share those details? Let me just... Uh... Okay. While I work that out, folks, please uh, type in your questions as well. Sunil, I see you there. So Sunil, do you want to ask a question? Oops, maybe he's not there. No, it's not, not. I, I, we, we we're going to chat, the question has come in here. Let me just say. What marketing strategy do you think is suitable for B2B businesses? For B2B businesses, uh, you shouldn't waste a lot of money on social media. Um, on B2B is basically sales. 
a door to door. There's no easy way. <coughs> knock on every door, but make sure <coughs> you choose the right doors to knock. If you keep knocking on the wrong doors and you say they don't open, uh, yeah. So you you need to I I say to people for B two B or even B two G was still uh, B two G is even more challenging than B two B. But B two B you need to 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 some people ask me do I hire salespeople directly if it's not in my own country. Um, do I find a distributor? Well, there's no right answer. Initially, I would say use distribution channels, but choose your channel partners very carefully. And because they know the market. So choose distribution channels, distributors who are used to selling to the segment you choose to serve. That means they already have customer relationships. So now, they are selling your product as an additional product. For example, if you are going to sell to banks, find the <coughs> systems integrators that are already selling to banks, right? So they already have customer base. So they can bring you to their customer base. They may not know your product so well. So then you have to support them in the initial marketing stage, but they already know the market. So Basically, you don't know the land. You need to find the people who knows the land or who has the connections with the customer and help them to market your product. Thanks, Chef. There's another question. For B2B sales, would you recommend telemarketing or lead generation? Um, again, I think um, telemarketing or lead generation, there's no quick answers to it. If you can get right database that means relevant warm database is good like for example if you had a trade show and you gather the business business cards of the people who visited your booth then using telemarketing to generate leads for appointments is can be quite useful or if you get leads that come into your websites or different blog sites those are what I call warm leads. Now, dollar marketing for cold leads, I don't recommend it because it's like shooting bullets into a blind sky. No, I totally agree. And and uh, right now, the way the system is, the cold leads do not actually generate. Uh, Jeff, how, how, how powerful do you think? We know uh, it's an obvious question, but I just wanted to understand the way we used to approach and get the whole uh, sense of the new market. And like uh, Paula had mentioned about telemarketing or, you know, cold leads, the whole system has gone digital and people are getting a lot of research done through surveys done digitally. Yes. Uh, I mean, yes, there is a lot of hype and digital is the way to go ahead. But then according to you in B2B and B2C separately, what actually works when you're talking about beyond Singapore? I think content um, is very important. So you're in, in the digital world, content strategy is very critical. So if you are selling, nobody wants to buy. If you are sharing, everybody wants to learn. And if they want to learn, you don't have to sell. They will buy if it's appropriate. And if they is not the right customer, it's not anyone you want anyway. So content marketing strategy is very important. Now use content marketing strategy to position yourself as an expert, as an authority in that specific product or service area you chose to serve, specifically for the segment you chose to serve. Now, if you want to sell to uh, women um, 35 to 45, a new brand of cosmetics in the Indian market, now, if you don't understand local customs, the certain <clears throat> ingredients of your product should not be in there if they're related to a cow or whatever else, then you're in trouble because you didn't understand the cultural nuances. Now, um, if you are marketing in your country to 25 to 35 years old and you want to market to 20 to 35 years old, in India, 
It may be different in your country. What content you share will be, is maybe attractive in your country, but maybe oppulsive in the other country. So be very aware. That's why I say you need a local guy, but you need to choose the right local guy. Now, if you get in bed with the wrong guy, you're in trouble too. So very true. I mean, it, uh, whatever market you're targeting, you need to get, you don't yourself need to get localized. You also need to hire the local guy so that who understands the nuances, that's the second best option if you yourself can't do it. And there are no free lunches. You need to yes. adopt and absorb that location before you can think of selling into that location. Yeah, you cannot, you cannot sell what you don't understand and you cannot sell to who you don't understand. And also and, I totally agree. And if your competition understands them better than you, you're in trouble. And, and the price points are different also. So for example, 100%. what price points work here might not work in the US or in India, yes. totally different yes. markets. Yeah, I give you uh, what I, I better don't name the brand. Uh, but you know, in, uh, in the early days in Vietnam, in, in, I was in Vietnam very early and even in China, this, the, the, the foreign shampoo makers, they say they, they, they can't sell shampoo because people use the same bar of soap they use to wash the floor, wash the window, they use it to wash the hair, wash the body, everything. So they say, we cannot sell these people, you know, they use the same bar of soap for everything. So, you know, wash their curtains, wash the floor, wash the glass, wash their face, wash their body, wash their hair, everything. One bar, same bar of soap. So you cannot sell them different soap for different purposes. Not true. It's just that the price point was not right. Now, how did they intelligently do and make the price point right? They make them into small sachets, one-time use. And for the distributors, they cannot stock up. They cannot stock up with these big bottles. It's too much price for them to stock up at one time. But with small sachets, they can sell. Even in Indonesia, I'll tell you how they manage to sell coffee upstream into the villages. They make them into one-time use small sachets. Now, if you remember in India in the old days, they could not sell cigarettes. People could not afford cigarettes, an entire pack. And the little uh, mom and pop shops in the corner, they will buy one stick at a time. And they will have a lighter next to that. And that happened in Singapore before. When I was a kid, that was the case. I saw them selling one stick of cigarette at a time. And then free light, free light, free light. <laughs> so yeah, I again, remember the lighter tied up with the thread. <laughs> correct. So you know, uh, no, at, at my time, they had matches. Uh, OK. <laughs> so again, this brings back to the point I was making. The same solution in the same country, in the same segment, at the different points of time change because things change over time. So how relevant are you? So the key word, if I leave today with anybody about marketing is the most important word ever is called relevance. How are you relevant in terms of who you choose to serve? Relative to your competition because it's never in isolation. It's never in isolation. So uh, I think it's the right time to close the session with, with the note that uh, you need to be relevant to the location or where you're trying to, uh, uh, to expand. And it, yes. it can be either the same location, but a different uh, market segment or a totally different uh, country to expand to. With and the that, same place, different era. <laughs> same place, different era, exactly. <laughs> From a matchbox to a lighter, things change very fast. With that, Jeffrey, I would like to thank you for this insightful session. Uh, uh, audience, we have this, we would have this session recorded and put on, on YouTube and a closed channel. So all our members would be able to view that. Uh, we, Jeffrey, we would request you probably another two months or uh, you know, in the next quarter to come back again to have a question answer round because sure. this has been super relevant and we would want more entrepreneurs to gain from your insight. With that, the last note I would like to say is that once you leave the session, there would be a pop-up with a survey, quick survey. It will really help us. Please fill that up before you, uh, you know, log off from the Zoom totally. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. This was a great evening with you. Thank you, Sidi. Thank you, Sudar. And thank you, Thai Singapore, for giving me this opportunity to share some marketing insights. And I leave uh, delighted with everyone the word relevance. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening to me.
Thanks, Jeff. I, I think because it's a webinar, they're not able to respond. Only Denise has yeah. got the permission to talk. That's why. Okay. But they're chatting and they're writing thank you and all the suggestions. Thank you. There. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.